Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Fyodor Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, there's a very interesting set of discussions about the workings of anger and a few other associated affects. And Dostoevsky's character, who represents an intellectual, will make a fundamental distinction between how ordinary people, or what he calls the, the man of action or man of character, the person who actually is something, how they handle their anger and indeed act upon and express their anger and manage to discharge it. And what takes place differently for the intellectual who is unable to fully or even really halfway deal with their feeling of anger and the things that led to it, the legitimate concerns that they, they have. Now, this discussion takes place more or less in two places, although you can see threads of it running through the rest of the work. One of them is in chapter three, and then the other is in chapter five, or section three and section five. And so if we think about how anger works, there's an assumption that Dostoevsky is making that we already understand what's going on when we get angry. And, and some of us may not, in fact, have a very good handle upon how this works. When we get angry, we have that affect. We have that emotional reaction because we feel that something was done that shouldn't be the case. And it could be a person doing it. It could be the, an animal. If we have a lot of anger problems, it could be the book not, not reading right or the wind blowing on us the wrong way, but whatever it happens to be. He even talks about getting angry because you've got a toothache. And why does God give me this? Or why does the universe give me a toothache? Let's stick just to people. So we get angry when somebody does something that we think shows us that they don't value us as much as themselves or the same that other people do or that they value other people. We feel a loss of status, not just an injury. You know, somebody bumping you in the street can make you angry, not just because the bump provokes a physical set of, you know, causes and effects, a chain reaction, as we say within your system and, you know, evolutionary biologists, wow, it got your adrenaline going. It got your adrenaline going precisely because there's a cognitive aspect to anger. Namely, you think that people shouldn't bump you like that because bumping you shows you that they don't value you, right? That they think that you are somebody who's worthy of being bumped. We could go on and on and on with all sorts of uh, other examples, but whatever we want to think in this case, we get angry because we think something was done that was wrong and it shouldn't have happened to us and that SOB shouldn't have done it. So we take some sort of offense. We think that there's some sort of injustice. And that's why we often think, well, you know, they did it to me. I'm going to go bump them. Or somebody says something mean to us. And we have a great term for this that has originated in recent years. We clap back, right? Somebody says something cutting. We say something cutting to them. And some people are, are quite good at this. Others uh, will stew for a while and then think of what the right thing was to say to that person. But unfortunately, they've already left, right? And we're all familiar with this. If we don't suffer from anger ourselves, every one of us knows somebody who does. And we've seen people act upon this. So we think that there's some sort of injustice that took place. And we may feel a sense of humiliation. Um, or we might not feel humiliated per se, but we might be like, that, that person lowered my status. I need to do something about it. 
Now, how does the ordinary person, what he calls the spontaneous person, the person of action, the person of character, how do they typically handle these offenses and getting angry? They do so in a way very different than the intellectual. They seek revenge and they seek revenge confidently. They go out there, you know, you uh, take their stapler and don't return it. They won't necessarily burn the whole place down unless you've done it a whole bunch of times. Some of you may catch the reference there uh, to a person who is in, in some respect kind of similar to the underground man. But you take it and you don't return it. Well, that's fine. They'll go and take your mug off your desk or something else. Or they'll bring it up in a meeting and call you out about it. Or they'll send an email, you know, with a picture of the missing stapler and say, you need to return this jackass or whatever else they want to throw in there. And, you know, it depends on what the offense is and how their mindset works. And it depends on a lot of social rules too. What counts as adequate revenge, but people in fact do that. It might be just giving somebody the finger or, you know, giving them a dirty look or not talking to them. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but this person will do so confidently. They're not going to say, oh, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to punch him in the face. No, if they don't think it's the right thing to do, if they think that's crossing too many lines and they won't punch them, they'll do something else, or maybe they won't take revenge at all. And Dostoevsky talks about this person as feeling themselves in the right. There's, there's two very interesting ways that he talks about this. Early on in chapter three says, um, it's, you know, normal people, when they are humiliated, they will repay the person in kind. Why? Because they, because of their innate stupidity, they consider revenge as merely justice. Revenge is what is right. A little bit further on, he talks about primary and secondary causes. Primary causes are the things that really make us do what we do, so our real motives or stuff like that. And we often mistake those for secondary causes, things that are caused by the primary cause, and we take that to be what's really going on. But, you know, we're, we're actually wrong about that. And he says that when I spoke of vengeance, it's said that a man avenges himself because he thinks it's the just thing to do. What does he mean? This implies he's found the primary reason, the basis for his action, which in this case is justice. Why is he uh, clapping back? Why is he slashing that person's tires? Why is he saying that mean thing to the neighbor or the spouse or the mailman or whoever it happens to be? Because that is justice and they are embodying it in their action. It actually makes them feel good. They're like, damn straight, I told that person. And you know, now everything is right in the world. He says this gives him foolproof peace of mind. So he avenges himself without qualms. Efficiently, certain throughout, he's acting fairly and honestly. The person can be self-assured. Now, that doesn't mean that later on they might not see things a little bit differently. You know, they do something to somebody and then they find out that it has had some tragic consequence and now they feel remorse about it. But that's not going to change how they felt at the time. And there's, you know, if, if they don't see any results that, that really bother them, they're not going to feel bad about it. They're going to be like, well, I shouldn't have lost my temper, but they had it coming to them. That's the way ordinary people deal with it, according to Dostoevsky. And a person who's angry like that, he also mentions they will sort of stop when they come to the metaphorical equivalent of a stone wall. So that could be the boss saying, all right, you're ticked off, knock it off. Because if you don't, you know, work together on this team, I'm going to fire both of you. Or it could be the police or it could be whoever, right? If there's something that, that represents a, a absolute impediment, the person stops up short by the wall and they're like, oh, okay, I can't go any further. I guess we'll uh, let things go. Or they may say, that's not a real wall. I'm going to burst through it and uh, consequences be damned. I'm going to get my revenge. And they still feel good about that. So that is the person of action. How is anger different for the intellectual? 
It's not in how they initially feel it. I mean, the, the intellectual can take offense a little bit more easily because they're more hyper-conscious. They will perceive slights where perhaps they aren't actually intended or where they are actually intended and the ordinary person would be too dumb to actually pick up on the fact that somebody is showing them contempt or is mistreating them or is, you know, disvaluing them in, in some way. And so they, they feel the anger. They sense that there's some sort of injustice, something wrong that's taking place, that they've been injured, that they've been harmed, that they've been insulted, that they've been lowered in some way, cheated, perhaps. And they don't like it. They don't like it any more than the ordinary person. But what they do with the anger is different. And now why is that? Dostoevsky doesn't say, well, they have different habits or, you know, they've been brought up differently. No, it has to do with their very intellectual capacities in some respect turning against them. Something that they can't prevent, by the way. So he talks about the intellectual person not being able to identify the revenge that they would like to take because they feel anger like everybody else with justice. Why not? They, they can see further. They realize that their motives are not as pure as the other person uh, might think that they are. They know that when they act in, in the same way as everybody else, they're not doing the right thing. They may even have a, a sense that it's never okay to injure another person in, in revenge or retaliation or punishment or however we want to put it. They may doubt whether that's all right. They can't have that nice, safe confidence that I'm doing the right thing by popping this person in the face or, you know, giving them a nice little zing or something along those lines. They can't identify their revenge as justice. And so Dostoevsky talks about the mouse. He uses the word mouse for this person because they retreat into a little hole. He says, let's assume it's been humiliated and that it wishes to avenge itself. It's possible that there's more spite accumulated in it than the, the person of nature and truth. This nauseating, despicable, petty desire to repay the offender in kind may squeak more disgustingly in the mouse than in the natural man who considers revenge as merely justice. Whereas the mouse, with its heightened consciousness, is bound to deny the justice of, its, of, of it. Then he says, um, it, it finds itself mired in questions and doubts and qualms. When it comes to actually taking action, well, I'm not sure if this is the right time to do it. You know, maybe there's going to be some unintended consequences or some spillover or, you know, do I really want to damage this relationship? Now the relationship kind of sucks because I'm being mistreated, but do I, do I want to make it worse? Will they retaliate against me? Will they, will they see me as, as like standing up for myself or will they think that I'm going too far and being aggressive? And we can go on and on and on with similar questions. Dostoevsky doesn't actually raise all of these, but he leaves it open to us because we may have experience of this to, to think about that. So they get mired in questions and doubts and they're unable to take action. They hesitate. What does that lead to? Well, you know, when you hesitate in the face of somebody who is perhaps bullying you, they're going to bully you some more. They're going to humiliate you some more. They're going to be like, ah, <laughs> look at them. They can't stand up for themselves. And it leads to more and more humiliation, which leads to further anger. He puts it in a very um, graphic way. He says, each question brings up so many more unanswered questions. A fatal pool of sticky muck is formed consisting of the mouse's doubts and torments, as well as the gobs of spit aimed at it by the practical men of action who stand around like judges and dictators and laugh lustily at it till their throats are sore. So this is a painful sort of experience. What does he do? Instead, he avenges himself every once in a while. He comes out of the mouse hole and sticks somebody, but he does so in ways that are petty, or we might say today, passive aggressive. 
and they're generally unsuccessful. He talks about um, this great line here, uh, the, the, the mouse, the person, the intellectual who's humiliated. He says, um, it does so in spurts from behind the stove anonymously, doubting its vengeance is right that it will succeed, feeling as a result it will hurt itself a hundred times more than it hurt the one against, it, who, against whom its revenge is directed, who probably won't even feel enough of an itch to scratch himself. So, you know, you, you save up all these, these lines and you're going to put them in an email to the person who's been bothering you. You're going to really show them. And they read it and they're like, oh, good, good joke, man. And you're like, this is supposed to crush you. And you're, they're like, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, I'm totally crushed. And then, you know, curses, right? <clears throat> the intellectual is not able to get the revenge that they want because they can't produce the result of pain or anger or whatever it happens to be in the other person. The revenge that they take is ineffective. It's too late. It's perhaps too, too intellectual, too cognitive, too well thought out for the person. They're like, I don't know what all these words that you're, you're, saying about me mean, but I mean, sounds pretty cool, man. You know, <laughs> you're supposed to be crushed by this. Well, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm so crushed. <laughs> it's just not going to work. He also talks a little bit later about, and this is in chapter five, about one's anger um, sort of dissolving away. He says that... Um, when, when I get, or when, when the, the, the person gets angry, they're, they're not able to keep it up in part because, uh, the laws of nature dissolve it. There's a kind of, what does he say? Disintegration that's, that's chemical, like everything else. As I think the, the anger vanishes, the reasons for it evaporate. The responsible person has never found the insult becomes an insult no longer, but just a stroke of fate, just like a toothache for which no one can be held responsible. When you know enough about the world and about the people who say bruise you and seem to insult you, you might still get angry, but your anger dissipates because you're like, well, they are a bunch of uh, idiots who grew up in this environment and think that this actually makes sense. And I'm not going to change them by imposing my wrath upon them. And you gradually uh, lose your anger. Now, does that mean that you, you are now in a happy state of equanimity or something? No, you just have the anger itself ebbing away, but it leaves other negative things in its wake, according to him. And it doesn't produce anything good. The other thing that does happen is that the underground man or the mouse, the intellectual, keeps remembering and ruminating upon the things that hurt them. They may even be adding to it. He talks in another chapter about imagining insults and imagining offenses. And this is another problem with, with being intellectual. It makes it difficult to let go of grudges. It makes it difficult to see that the anger is in part something that we are ourselves manufacturing and contributing to. And it leads to this, this, you could say, swamp within the person where anger can slowly get transmuted into something that's no longer quite so healthy, no longer quite so wholesome, and becomes something similar to what later on Nietzsche will call Rizantamont. And I think that is part of what Dostoevsky is describing and diagnosing within the intellectuals of his own time through this character of the underground man. 